Hello, Mr. Bokvar. How are you today? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you, buddy. All right. All right. Uh, it's been a while. Great to have you back and, and talk to you. Uh, I've seen a few clips you've done recently and some of the things that you're talking about, Peter, and uh, you're really bullish on the oil market. Um, you're talking triple digits are, uh, you know, in the cards. So why don't we start with uh, what's top of mind for you with that going on? Does that make the Fed's job uh, easier to make more hikes or, you know, more difficult to pause with uh, energy heading higher? Well, it definitely complicates uh, their their plans. Uh, and of course, they'll tell us that they only look at core inflation and uh, oil and food will do what they do. But we know that oil prices filter into a lot of different things. And uh, I, I think either way, I think Powell is going to be very stubborn with respect to inflation and in that you know, there is one thing to see a slowdown in inflation. And for all we know, uh, we can see a one handle, a two handle late this year, early next year because of the deceleration of rents. But there is going to be another completely different thing in keeping inflation low and keeping it there. And I think that's where he's got the most difficult job. And but you have to understand Powell's perspective now. Is, you know, he's an older guy. He's got only a few years left at the Fed. Uh, Biden didn't want him anyway. And he's only focused on his legacy. He's only focused on uh, not being the guy that let inflation flare and not being the guy that allowed it to uh, reaccelerate again. So I think okay. that um, oil is just going to give him another reason to stay tight for a while. And uh, well, now where he still may cut rates in the face of a recession, uh, the days of going back to zero and days of massive QE at least for a while, are over. Okay. So uh, with Paul taking that stance, uh, Peter, here, here's, uh, I could actually see 490 in the 10-year based on technicals. So can you back up that rate uh, fundamentally that we could get to 490 on the 10-year? This is based upon the formation and the breakout of this formation. It'll give me 490 maybe by year end. Is Is that realistic unrealistic in so your i've view? argued i've argued for a while um, that in trying to figure out where long rates go you cannot just look at where you think u.s inflation and growth is going and i have friends of mine because of supply to, because of supply yeah i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transition to that you know I, okay. I have friends of mine that have been bullish on duration and they're bearish on the economy and like you got to buy the tenure. And I just keep saying this analysis is it's got to be much more expanded than that. We are, we are coming off an epic sovereign bond bubble that okay. peaked with when we had $18 trillion of negative yielding bonds. And we are seeing an unwind. This is not just the supply thing. This is a major global uh, no, unwind. Sovereign and debt crisis. It's a crisis. Well, I, I maybe it transitions to a crisis. Uh, I'm not okay. going to use that word just yet, uh, but we have. I think this can be as much as uh, the Japanese getting out of negative interest rate policy, possibly by the end of this year, early next year. Uh, that was hinted at by Governor Ueda over the weekend. It was the BOJ widening yield curve control from 50 to 100 basis points. That I think was a really big deal, and. Yes, and then you can also throw in supply uh, as we have a budget deficit as a percent of GDP at eight and a half percent with the unemployment rate still with a three handle, which is unprecedented. Uh, you've also had at the same time, the Fed is essentially selling treasuries via QT. Banks are uh, reducing their exposure to treasuries and foreigners as a percentage of, of, of total treasury ownership are down to about 30%. It was in the mid forties about 10 years ago. It's a combination of all these factors. I mean, today, the U.S. 10-year yield is higher, uh, not because people are expecting a reacceleration in U.S. growth, but because of, of, of the, the jump in the 10-year GGB yield that then led to selling in bonds throughout Asia and sovereign bonds in Europe and U.S. treasuries today. Okay, so it's only adding fuel to the fire that was already burning. 
with what the Japanese are going to do. Does that give you a view on the end? Uh, do you think it's possible that we're getting a bottom in the yen or a peak in U.S. dollar Japanese yen up here? Well, I thought that the yen would bottom when the Bank of Japan made their yield curve control move. That turned out not to be the case, and we've seen now a retest of those yeah. yen lows that are, at least today, temporarily reversing. Uh, I think that the yen is in the hands of the BOJ. Uh, no amount of intervention, or uh, physical or verbal, uh, will matter unless the BOJ gets out of negative interest rates, which, again, UEDA seems to be laying the groundwork for the possibility of which could happen by the end of the year or early next year. Uh, so that would lead to uh, probably a yen rally, and that this week, recent weakness in sell-off is more of just a, a retest that will hold and that maybe we do actually get a more sustainable yen rally. But again, it's in okay. the hands of the BOJ. I mean, that's the thing about analyzing the FX markets is, you know, so much is in the hands of, of central bankers. Okay, so the dollars in the hands of the Fed, um, if they're going to stay higher for longer and Europe is weaker economically, and maybe the ECB might be talking about their last hike this week, we're getting a little pullback, but it's been pretty persistent, relentless rally that we've had in the dollar. It's above a lot of weekly moving averages. What would turn the dollar back down in your view, Peter? I think the, the ends of the, the Fed rate hikes uh, and taking out that the, the last possibility of a hike that uh, we're still about 50-50 on, according to the Fed funds futures if we look out uh, to the end of the year. Uh, that can be enough. I mean, in, you know, in retrospect, over the last couple of years, uh, the dollar has really only followed uh, the more aggressive Fed relative to other central banks. Uh, it really hasn't been anything more. And even with this dollar rally you know, to 104, 105, you know, the dollar was 114 a year ago. Right, so right here. Is, it, is, yeah. it, is, this, is this really a robust dollar rally? If no, it's one of the weakest. 10 handles. Yeah, if we're still 10 handles below where we were. Uh, a, a year ago, no, it's not really much of a of a, of a, of a dollar rally. So yeah, um, compared to yen, uh, which is approaching the intervention levels, and this was October, Peter, and I want to ask you about this. A lot, you know, that's when the market bottomed too, and a lot of markets have retraced uh, their October moves. There's uh, there's the yen. Uh, here's the uh, yuan. Uh, actually taking out last October's low, a uh, high, I mean, and then you have uh, the 10-year, uh, had its previous peak was last October. So a lot of things have retraced everything in October. Here's the uh, uh, TLT, which is about to take out the October low uh, that gave the bond market stability, but all it could do is move sideways, even weaker than the dollar rally, right? So uh, there's got to be some type of reversion to the mean uh, because this is where the uh, stock market was in October. And a lot of all these other markets have already recovered everything they lost or everything they gained since that time frame. Um, does that mean anything to you? Uh, hasn't the market been unusually resilient that uh, we were at 4.3 uh, here in the 10-year? Uh, and we're at four three here. I think the the stock market has been kept afloat uh, by um, people that don't want to miss the so called end of the rate hike rally. People think that once the Fed is done raising interest rates, then there's an all clear sign. And I really think that has driven a lot of the rally. Yes, you can throw in AI and and, and yeah. all the tech enthusiasm that that further exaggerated it, but. The, set, the second the Fed was slowing down the pace of their rate increases when they did four in a row of 75 basis points, once that fourth one ended, the dollar topped and the stock market bottomed. And right. who doesn't who doesn't want to miss, oh, the Fed is done rally because the Fed, of course, is going to make everything fine. That, I think, is a lot of the mentality. Then, of course, yes, self-landing belief and uh, the, the earnings recession, which is now three quarters in, everyone thinks is over which maybe is the case, maybe not. Uh, but I think, again, a lot of it is, is the Fed. Don't want to miss that. And, um, and, and this, this 
soft landing grief, which I think is, uh, and I think the, the analysis has to be deeper because what happens if it's a soft landing, but a protracted period of anemic growth, you know, is that right. any better? Or, um, so, or the Chinese restrict the use of iPhones. Yeah. I mean, I, what do you think I, of I was, that? What do you, yeah. what do you think of that? That's a pretty ugly chart in Apple, or it could turn into one. That's a weekly, but the daily, you know, I, mean, I see Apple's a, trouble is that uh, it has a high valuation and they don't really grow anymore. Well, the you're bearish tech, right? Grow. You're bearish tech, right? Well, it, 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 it's, it's, I, I, I'm more worried about tech and, and, and the valuations just being so extreme. I mean, talking about Apple, um, you know, we, we're, we're long in client portfolios, but uh, Every, from a valuation. The long. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, when you're 30 times earnings, there's no room for error and you have no growth. And now you have a potentially a large market of yours getting crypt. Now, Chinese are not going to cut off Apple iPhones because it, uh, Apple through Foxconn employs millions of people in the country. So they're not going to. Um, they're not going to cut themselves off completely, but look, you have you have state governments in the U.S. that are telling government workers you can't have TikTok on your phone. So Apple right. saying to government workers you can't use your iPhone. Well, they're just doing what we did, right? I mean, I, it's, I'm not it's so, no yeah. different. So, yeah, but, I, but I think the, the yes, but I think the 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 uh, Apple as a stock, separate as a company, uh, is just way overvalued for very little growth. Uh, phenomenal company, huge cash flow, but. Uh, stock buybacks have really been the only driver of, of, of any earnings movement at all. And uh, I, I just think that um, it could be time for a re-rating of Apple stock. 140? Um, I mean, just looking at a chart, yeah, I mean, I guess that that's possible. Uh, I mean, was, these are ugly. Things. It was 80 in, in pre-COVID. Right, I remember. I'm not saying it goes there. I'm just saying that, you know, there, there's, there's further downside to some of those moving averages. Okay. Yeah, one thirty monthly. Uh, okay, so uh, you like the oils, uh, oil service, ex explorers, uh, producers. Uh, what part of the oil patch you like? I mean, all of the above, but we're mostly long the uh, EMP stocks and uh, also some natural gas stocks. I think natural okay. gas is also pretty cheap as well, and um, going into the it, fall and into the winter. Yeah. Uh, Maybe Europe won't be. Uh, Europe may not be as lucky uh, weather-wise yeah, I mean, as they were last year. Yeah, I mean, the storage levels are pretty good there, but um, there, I think there's almost no chance that they get away with as warm a winter as they had last year. Obviously, okay. we hope they do from the sake of, of prices there, but I, I just, I'm not a meteorologist, but I think it would be unlikely to repeat it. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, emerging markets. Because I know that's something that you you know, pay attention to. They they actually weakened before U.S. domestic markets, didn't they? And they're they're kind of underperforming. Well, an if EM. You, yeah, yeah. Well, if, if China is part of that EM, we can yeah, explain it obviously with with the uh, the economic data there. But um, and, and I'm going to separate out the, the politics of China and just look at you know analyze there the economy is. and. You know, the, the, the Chinese economy has been mostly weighed down by obviously the residential real estate distress on the developer yeah. side, not really on the on the on the homeowner side, because there's a lot of equity that people have in homes. Um, but there is a, a wealth effect in the sense that home prices are softening that could affect consumer spending. But consumer spending has been OK when it comes to leisure, travel, hospitality, post uh, COVID reopening uh, and then manufacturing in China. Well, they're suffering what manufacturers around the world are suffering. They're in a recession. Uh, the demand for goods is, is, is obviously a hangover from, from COVID. Uh, Do you so think not... we're going to have the reopening, reopening trade? Because uh, I know that you were pretty bullish on the Chinese reopening, which turned out to be a, kind of a, you know, anticlimactic. It really didn't turn into anything big, but people well, it, still it are to... waiting for it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, ended, it, was okay. it was pretty good on the consumer spending side. Uh, uh, again, I mean, domestic travel in China is above where it was in 2019. Okay. So here we travel. are. Yeah, so that, that's a pretty sharp snapback when it comes to the, the, the reopening. Uh, yeah. International travel has been that's, muted for regulatory reasons, yeah. but it's beginning to come back. I mean, if you look at the Macau 
um, number, numbers that they, they've bounced back pretty nicely. Uh, Australia's tourism industry the other day said that international travel from China is back to about 60% of uh, 2019 levels in Q2. That was up from 40% uh, um, in, in Q1. So uh, I, I do think that um, that part of the Chinese economy is snapping back rather quickly. Uh, but like I said, manufacturing is global and they're under stress as just the rest of the world is. And they're obviously dealing with a, a property unwind that COVID or no COVID was going to happen anyway. Uh, I think that um, they've taken steps lately to uh, lower down payment requirements that has led to a lift in the demand for yeah. housing. Uh, so yeah. maybe that helps to stabilize. I mean, you can buy a house in the U.S. 3% down. 3%. Not anymore. Well, yeah, you can through FHA. Okay. Um, if, you're in, if you're in China, um, if you were looking to buy a place in the major cities, their down payment requirements were 30 to up to 80%. Uh, now okay. it's about back. It's it, it's either forty to thirty to thirty to twenty. I can't remember what it, what what I read. But yeah, no leverage. The, 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 there's still there's still a lot of equity that's at the, that people have to come up with. That um, but even that small like, light tweak brings more demand. So I think we need to see some of the stabilization. We look at iron ore prices, and half the demand for iron ore comes from China. And today on the uh, the loan data news out of China, um, you have uh, iron ore prices at the highest level since March. All of a sudden. Okay, so they're building. So, from an economic standpoint, China's not collapsing. It's a big place, and um, you know all it needs to do is somewhat stabilize. Which, if global manufacturing at some point stabilizes, because uh, companies need to restock uh, the destocking of inventories that we've been seeing so dramatically, then China m- manufacturing is going to recover as well, just as it will in the U.S. and Europe. Okay, well then maybe they do want to let the yuan go. So no, they could they ex- export. They they don't. So they no. could export. All right. They don't. They don't want to see a flare up of inflation. They 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 want to shift their economy more to consumption based. And uh, you can't have a healthy consumer if you devalue their, their purchasing power. Okay. So would you? Um, they just want to stable buy it. They don't want to weaken one. Would Would you trade it the other way? Um, I I, I double the top. One, the one the one's going to trade with the yen. It's going to trade with the pound. It's going to trade with the euro. Okay. It's going to trade right. with a lot of the major currencies. So if the dollar weakens, it's going to weaken broadly. Well, if the dollar doesn't weaken here, Peter, and uh, Dixie goes to, you know, I know it's been feeble so far, but what if we start seeing 108 or 110? Do you think that's possible? I, I know that there's I, a lot of bullishness in the dollar right now. Yeah, I can't discount it, but here we are a, a week away, week and a half away from the next Fed meeting where they're not going to do anything. And you have okay. you're seeing softening in the labor market, which I believe means that they're done. I, I don't okay. I don't know the catalyst to get the dollar index at this point up to 108. Okay, yields. Well, here we are. The yields are rising around the world. Rising um, faster. Here. Well, yeah. look, look and at we'll G- come down. Your, Let me you ask tenure, you this: Are you your JGB yield today? Was the yeah. highest level since 2014? Okay. And uh, who's, is, who's the largest holder of U.S. Treasuries? Uh, it's Japan. Japanese. And yeah. so if they start to find that the JGB market's more attractive, well, that's not, that'll be yen positive, dollar negative, irrespective of where U.S. rates are. Okay. Uh, so gold, I know you're a long term bull in this stuff. I mean, I, when you look at all this, when you see all the stuff that's been thrown at gold, you see this sharp rise in the long end of the U.S. yield curve over the past month. Gold's yeah. hanging in. You see yeah. this dollar bounce. Gold's hanging in. I mean, what, what are the two biggest bear cases against gold? Rising real yields and a stronger dollar. Well, we've had both, and gold hangs in like a champ. So yeah. I don't. In the face of that, I don't get the bear case on gold. If those two things can't knock it down, so I remain pretty positive. And if it okay. coincides with the end of the Fed. Um, rate increases, uh, then yeah, that, that will be a, a positive uh, catalyst for it. Uh, are you thinking at all about the CBDC, Peter, uh, with it um, potentially coming online next year, second quarter is what I'm reading? Isn't it a big monetary story that we're going to change from what we have now, uh, kind of like on the level of Bre- Bretton Woods? I think the politics of 
getting away with uh, a CBDC in the US is going to be really difficult. Uh, I think the privacy pushback is going to be so enormous that it's not happening here. From your lips. For years to come. Okay. From your lips, Peter. Okay. So you think uh, politically, who's anti, uh, you know, I, I'm not hearing anything except from DeSantis uh, about being anti-CBDC. I, I just think that. Um, you it, think the general see. public, yeah, the, general the general public. public discussed it with him. What if we're uh, what if we're in a uh, crisis at the time and it's uh, and it looks like it's put out there as a solution, uh, say the dollar's really weakening or we have, uh, uh, you know, we still have banking problems. So do you still think that we're in a banking crisis or we ever were? Uh, oh, it was a crisis. This is just a, uh, a tough time the banking sector and we're probably going to have more failures so uh, okay so I, I i i don't want to call it a, a crisis i would just call it uh banking commercial banking is now a tough business and whether that's because of uh, the yield curve or the regulatory uh or their bond book. yeah okay um, or their, their 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 duration upside down bond book yeah uh, i just think that it's a it's a tough business right now rather than a crisis, okay. but being a tough business means that uh, you lend less and that you know, chips away at, at, at the access to capital for uh, small, medium sized businesses. Well I, well, I don't know. I, I personally think that, uh, you know, there's a possibility that this was uh, by design. And the like you talk about the pushback in CBDC, and I agree there will be, but uh, if people are in fear mode, because uh, we have markets that are uh, radical and not in taking down their 401ks and it's offered as a solution is the way to uh, uh, push back against the pushback that when people are panicking and in fear is when they could make a move like that. Maybe, but I don't know what, what it's, what it's curing by, by using that. Well, as yeah, as I don't either. I, I think it's exacerbating, but I yeah. uh, just wanted to bring it up and uh, so, you know, and see what you thought. And I sure hope you're right that uh, we have enough backbone so it doesn't happen. Um, anything else you want to wrap with besides me telling people that anytime you're on CNBC to turn the volume up and you, uh, and and any time and that they should follow you on Twitter at P Bookvar and uh, you still you're publishing the book report and people could just go to your Twitter handle and click your sub stack mm -hmm. and that'll give them a place to sign up for it and everyone should do it. Yes. Thank you, Dale. I mean, I, I think the, the most noteworthy thing here of the past month has been, um, you know, the rise in long-term interest rates, you know, people got sort of complacent yeah. thinking that, okay, inflation's decelerating, which it is. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's almost done and all is fine. And then all yeah. of a sudden you have this rise in long-term rates, not for good reason, I don't believe. I think it's for reasons that I discussed earlier. And that really complicates the story here. Uh, you know, the 10 year yield today is rising to yeah. you know, almost 430, not because there was some great economic data point today. It was because of what went on in the GGB market. So uh, would you tell people to be careful, uh, you know, in their indexes and spiders and everything here that it might be a good time to think about return of capital rather on, than on capital? The S&P was trading at 15 times earnings. Uh, I'd be worried less with the trading at 20 times worth, uh, yeah. multiple with yields doing what they're doing. I'm worried more. Okay. And should people go out and mortgage your uh, house and buy NVIDIA calls? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That was a rhetorical question. Yes, anyway, uh, anyway, Peter, thanks so much. I, I love getting together with you. I learn from you every time. Thanks, Dale. Uh, it was fun. All right. So uh, success during the fall trading season. Yep, you too. And I'll, get a hold, I'll get a hold of you and we'll, we'll speak in the winter, my trading warrior brother. Great. Sounds good. All right. Peter Bookvar, everybody. Follow him at P Bookvar. Read his letter. 
and turn up the volume when you see him on TV. Thanks again, buddy. Thank you. And that, and that's a wrap, everyone. You could join the team in 15 minutes on the morning edge. And I'll see everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. Good hunting. And don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Adios. Hey, traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.